Welcome, everybody. It's Friday, November 14th, 2014, and I am delighted to be joined once again by George Reisman. George Reisman is Professor Emeritus of Economics at Pepperdine University. He earned his Ph.D. from Ludwig von Mises at New York University, one of a handful of people to receive a Ph.D. under the direction of Mises. George is the author of Capitalism, a huge treatise, and he is one of the best slayers of fallacies I know. Stay tuned after my conversation with George Reisman for a little update on my activities. But right now, let's turn to George Reisman. George, welcome back to the show. Well, glad to be here, Tom. I'm enjoying coming back. I had somebody say to me, I guess at least a week ago, you have to have somebody on to deal with this statement by Hillary Clinton. And I thought of you, George, first person I thought of to, to refute this. Now, she's claiming that she misspoke. They always say that, right? They always misspeak uh-huh. when they get in trouble. But even if, even if I accept her explanation, the explanation still isn't any good. Her initial statement was, don't let anybody tell you that corporations create jobs and all this. And she said that this is trickle-down economics. And she claims that right. what she meant to say was, don't let anybody tell you that tax breaks create jobs. But I mean, eh, it's still pretty close. She says that trickle-down economics, so-called, has been a stupendous failure. Can can you clarify all this? What does she mean by trickle-down economics anyway, and how, in fact, are jobs created? Even though, of course, you and I don't really think in terms of jobs created, but that's the way they talk, so we'll we'll take their language for for now. Right. Well, the way uh, we can think of jobs being created, but people having uh, gainful employment, and the overwhelming bulk of the jobs are created by business firms. Uh, all you have to do is realize, I think there's a grand total of about uh, 120 million people employed by private businesses and uh, roughly another 20 million employed mainly by the government. And so at least uh, uh, six out of seven jobs are in private business. And they are created. I mean, it's sort of so obvious as to be ridiculous. Uh, If a new business arrives in a town and they advertise for workers, well, these are jobs that didn't previously exist in that town, and they're created by that business. If a business closes, the jobs that were previously there are gone. So uh, and it's practically the same kind of uh, degree of obviousness, the same uh, if she were to say, uh, standing up there and saying, don't let anybody tell you it's... uh, farmers that grow crops, or women that have babies. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. With that same look of, of smug self-satisfaction, she's just an ignoramus. And uh, th- there's no way to misspeak like that. I mean, it's a, a totally different subject. If she's talking about tax breaks, well, that's another issue. But that's not what she said. She said, don't let anybody tell you it's corporations and businesses create jobs. I think that's a direct verbatim yeah. quote. Yes. Well, they create paid employment, and they do that uh, by means of people saving, uh, their investors have saved, uh, they've accumulated capital, um, the uh, business firm starts with a certain capital invested, uh, one of the things it does is go out and hire employees. And now, uh, this taps into wider issues. Uh, you know, the left uh, has this violent hatred of the rich. The rich is the 1%, and uh, all of these other people are the 99%. Well, it's the wealth of the rich. It's not in their larders. It's not in their pantries. It's invested in the means of production, including uh, in the funds that uh, that provide payrolls. And so the wealth of the rich is the source of the demand for the labor of practically everybody and the source of the supply of the products that everybody buys. And so uh, the more rich people that we have whose wealth is in the means of production, the higher will be wages and the more abundant will be the supply of products and the lower their prices. And the, the, whole, the left, you know, they, they, they look at this and it's too complicated for them. They call this, oh, that's trickle down. They can't hold a few propositions together, so they say trickle down. Now, they have an alternative uh, theory of how to improve the standard of living. They want the, they want a higher, higher wages and higher incomes for the poor, and they want it now. And they're just going to grab it. 
Their theory is not trickle-down, it's loot and plunder. That's how they think you improve the standard of living. You tax the wealth of the rich, so they can't open more factories, they can't have more stores and warehouses and whatever. They don't have the funds to pay wages. It's being taken over by the likes of Hillary and Elizabeth Warren and Obama. And that's how people are supposed to prosper. I mean, this is just lunacy. Well, they think, well, there are two, two things I want to raise with you. I'll do, I'll do one at a time. Yeah. Let's try and think of the most dignified way to express whatever it is that they're trying to say. They could be saying that what really stimulates the economy is when yeah. you get welfare payments that go to the poor, then they have money to spend. They, they think that uh, redistribution puts money in the hands of people who are likely to spend it. If we don't have redistribution, we have it in the hands of people who are more likely to save it. I mean, this is like low, low, low-level Keynesianism on a very vulgar level, but I yeah. think it's what all the media believes. They create the jobs. The poor, when they spend the money they got from their welfare check, they create the jobs by spending the money. I think it was Mises sometime in his seminar who gave an analogy. Imagine you had a restaurant with a doorman, and the doorman would give $50 to every passerby, provided they spent that $50 in buying from the restaurant. <laughs> okay, now, yeah. you, you just don't grow rich by giving money to people who will be generous enough to take your products. Your loss is the products. You've lost by this. Uh, what, what, what creates prosperity for business is not deadbeat spending money that they've taken from you. It would be they, they're, they're going to work and earning money and spending money that they've earned. And that way, we have in, in earning money, they're putting goods into the market. They're uh, contributing to the supply of things. Uh, so when they take goods from you, they've also put other goods in that if, if you don't get, other people get, and you get goods from other people. So there isn't this drain of some people doing the producing and other people being kind enough to do the consuming. That's just ridiculous. You don't gain by giving money to people to, people to buy from you. You're just losing goods by that. Well, I, I think the other thing is they think the rich yeah. spend their money, they mostly just dissipate their wealth on frivolous things and conspicuous consumption and private planes and th and they they think that it's naive to think these people are creating jobs they're just living luxurious lifestyles you know they don't have any conception of where the wealth of the rich is uh, it, it, you know they think of the capitalist though as always a fat man and their view of the world is here's a capitalist with a plate piled eight feet high with spaghetti or whatever, and uh, <laughs> at the other side of the table is a starving worker with three beans on his plate. And the substance of economics is you have to take some of this tremendous surplus away from the plate of the capitalist and put it on the plate of the starving worker. They have no concept of capital. They have no concept of wealth being invested in the means of production. The wealth of the rich is not on their plates, it's not in their refrigerators or pantries, it's not in their personal consumer's goods, it's in the means of production. It's in factories, department stores, warehouses, pipelines, uh, freighters, uh, airplanes, trains, means of production. Now that's where the wealth is, and uh, that wealth is serving, as I've said, as the base of the demand for the labor of everybody, and the supply of the products that everybody buys. And all you have to do is think, where would you rather be a worker? Um, in Mexico, uh, where you have uh, very, very, poor, very a few and uh, pretty poor businessmen, or in the United States, where there are multi-billion dollar corporations competing with one another, including ultimately indirectly competing for your labor. And where is the average person better off? In a society uh, with abundant factories, farms, mines, stores, whatever, uh, and uh, 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 heavy competition for labor, or in an impoverished economy where everyone is miserably poor. And obviously, it's to the self-interest of the average worker that there be large numbers of very wealthy employers competing for his services and producing the goods that he buys. Every, we benefit from the wealth of others. See, the, the, the left... Uh, is still in the in the dark ages intellectually. Uh, in the age of feudalism, if you uh, saw a farmer's field and his uh, maybe had an animal or two, and you asked who benefited.
from that field and those animals in his barn. Well, in those days, people were producing for their own consumption and the consumption of their own families. They weren't producing for the market. So the only people who benefited from privately owned means of production in the context of feudalism were the owners. But when you have a market economy, everyone is benefiting from the privately owned means of production who buys the products. I benefit from the property of Ford Motor Company when I buy a Ford car. I benefit even when I buy another kind of car because Ford's competition influences the price of that car and makes it lower. Uh, as a worker, I, I benefit from the existence of Ford, uh, Microsoft, uh, all of the major companies, all the companies throughout the country, because that's setting the terms of competition for my labor. So the, the greater the number and the greater the wealth of businessmen and capitalists and corporations, the more abundant the supply of products and the, the higher is the demand for labor and, the, and, and wages. Now, I know the answer is going to be somewhat similar, but I know you nevertheless will have a unique take on the subject of inequality, which it seems to be everywhere now. It was not yeah. that big of an issue. I mean, it's always been an issue for, for the left, but now, the past five years or so, they just won't stop talking about it. What is the George Reisman take on the issue of inequality in the United States, income inequality? Okay. Well, I think uh, there's two basic things I want to say about it. Uh, I think it's the, the sudden upsurge is the result of the expansion of credit by the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve creates new and additional money, and the uh, major places that it goes to are the stock market and the real estate market. And the people who own the stocks are, by and large, uh, wealthier rather than poorer people, and the people who have uh, real estate are, uh, by and large, wealthier rather than poorer. And so uh, that's where the gains are concentrated, uh, resulting from this new and additional money. Now, it's uh, remarkable to me that people don't go over the same uh, uh, statistics uh, in the period of, of, a, of a collapse or of downturn. Um, when the stock market collapsed and the real estate market collapsed, had we taken the statistics on inequality then, I think we would have found much, much less of it. Uh, we have a, a substantial degree of artificially uh, government-created inequality through expansion of the money supply, uh, boosting the price of stocks and real estate. That's uh, one major issue. Uh, another um, major point is that uh, a normal inequality uh, operates to the benefit of less capable people. Uh, uh, we have people who are unequal in their capabilities. The way that less capable people are able to compete is by uh, accepting a lower income. Uh, imagine we have uh, two workers, one of whom can... Uh, produce uh, uh, 20 widgets in an hour, or the other of whom can produce only two widgets in an hour. What's required for someone producing two units to be competitive with someone who can produce 20 units? Well, if he's willing to take one-tenth the wage or less than one-tenth the wage, he's competitive and more than competitive. Uh, this is how less capable people uh, regularly outcompete more capable people. Uh, by by taking a lower income. Um, imagine that uh, someone like Bill Gates is just a superhuman being who could do everything better than practically anybody else, including uh, being a janitor. Imagine Gates can do the work of 10 janitors in the time uh, they, they do the work of one janitor. Well, uh, Gates is making millions of dollars an hour, or did. If a janitor is willing to work for $10 an hour, and Gates would be willing to be a janitor for a million dollars an hour, who out competes who? Right. So th that, see, that, the law of association, as Mises described it, yeah. completely escapes the vast majority of people, even though you observe this in your daily life all the time. There's so many truths about the economy that escape yeah. people, even though they observe them every single day. Now, I. I ultimately come back to, you can sort through the data and you can say that some of the inequality may be fostered, as you say, because of artificial credit creation. I completely believe that. Th there are yeah. people who get crony contracts through the government, all kinds right. of things like that. But what it boils down to me, uh, it boils down to me this way, that, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm an author and a public speaker, and the royalties right. that I earn from my books are in no way yeah. affected by the fact that somebody else has a private plane. The speaking, right. f the speaking fees that I earn 
are in no way affected by the fact that somebody has a yacht. Somebody's yacht is not stealing a portion of my speaking fees. These are completely and utterly separate. But I think the left's view is that somehow this money is stolen, like the way the first world has stolen the resources of the third world. I, I don't know how yeah. we got rich by stealing from poor people, but that, that's the standard view. Right. Now, I would say, uh, I would disagree with you in one uh, way. I would say the fact that there are people that have yachts and planes uh, not only does not make your income lower, it makes it higher. Because their ability to get yachts and planes motivates them to go on working, accumulating capital, improving the methods of production, and that's serving to increase the supply of products available to everyone and, and the demand for labor. So the fact that there are wealthy people who can have yachts and planes that motivates them to do things that benefit everybody else. So it's not that there's no loss, there's a positive gain. I accept that. Fair enough. Now, I want to turn to a completely different topic. This is an essay of yours that I actually read quite some time ago when I was much younger. And I guess, is it that you've republished it? Yeah, I've republished it. But before we get there, do I have time to say one more thing? Oh, well, please, take you have all the time you want. Yes, please. Okay. You know, these efforts to raise the minimum wage um, locally to $15 an hour, whatever, or even just yeah. to $10 an hour, uh, they don't realize that uh, they're depriving the least capable people of the ability to compete. See, right now, if the minimum wage is seven and a quarter an hour, uh, the people who can make $10 an hour, let alone $15 an hour, are not looking to take jobs that pay only seven and a quarter. They're kept out of those lines because they can earn 10 or 15. But now, if the jobs that presently pay seven and a quarter will themselves pay 10 or 15, then you're inviting the competition of these other people who are more qualified and able to earn more. And that's going to squeeze out the least qualified people. It's going to end up, they just won't be able to find work. And it's particularly damaging to teenage blacks, uh, by and large, they have very, very low qualifications. They desperately need to get their foot in the door of employment. The minimum wage should be abolished, at least as far as they're... It should, actually, it should be abolished for everybody. But if you wanted to make a compromise politically, they should exempt teenagers from the minimum wage. Then teenagers, maybe they'd have to work for $5 an hour. I don't know. But they'd get their foot in the door of unemployment. Uh, of employment. We'd see a dramatic drop in teenage unemployment, particularly among black teenagers, and they'd start to get absorbed into the system. They could gain some work skills, and then after a while they'd be earning more money because they'd be better qualified. So I wanted to be sure to say that. Plus, as an empirical fact, so few people earning the minimum wage wind up still earning it one year hence. That it, right. it goes to show that it really is the first step to something better for people, but if they don't get the first step, they don't get the something better. The essay right. that I want to talk to you about, because uh, you, you mentioned it to me in an email, is this essay, right. Education and the Racist Road to Barbarism. So in case we, right. in case there are any anybody on the left listening in who isn't outraged yet, wait till they hear yeah. the subject of this essay. Because in here, I, I, I take away from this your central point, that you believe it possible to demonstrate the objective superiority of Western civilization. That's an unfashionable yeah. opinion to take, George Reisman. Yes, I know. And the reason I do that is I apply the standard of knowledge. Uh, there, different civilizations are uh, characterized by different degrees of, the, of, the, of, the, of ability to acquire knowledge. Now, if you have a, a culture, I hesitate to call it a civilization, that has not yet reached the level of, of having writing, there's very, very little knowledge that they're able to transmit to the next generation. Everything has to be by oral tradition. Uh, a, a culture that develops the art of writing is in a position to, uh, translate, to transmit and to accumulate far more knowledge than one that hasn't. If then you have another culture that's uh, developed uh, numerous scientific and, and uh, mathematical principles, that's a higher stage of ability to acquire knowledge. If you have one like ancient Greece and Rome that has developed the laws of logic and the principle of causality, well, between logic and knowing that things have cause and effect, uh, that underlies a vast increase in the ability to acquire and apply knowledge. And then finally, with modern Western civilization, we have everything that was present in uh, Greco-Roman civilization, 
Thus, uh, tremendous advances in science and mathematics and all other lines of, of, uh, of endeavor. Uh, and in addition, we have a, a division of labor economy on a scale vastly greater than theirs and freedoms of speech and press. Both of these represent a great increase in the ability to acquire and apply knowledge. Uh, the uh, division of labor economy, uh, each specialized job has its own specialized body of knowledge. So steel workers have a somewhat different body of knowledge than auto workers. Uh, within steel working and automobile working, there are many further specializations, each with distinct bodies of knowledge. And everyone gets the benefit of all of the specialized bodies of knowledge just by buying their products. Uh, each person has a specialized body of knowledge as a producer, and by virtue of that specialized body of knowledge, he earns money, he's able to go and buy the products of all the other specializations and sub-specializations. Um, contrast that with a third world economy where people are living as self-sufficient farmers and, and there the body of knowledge entering into production is essentially that of what one family or small village can hold, uh, much, much less. And finally, uh, the freedoms of speech and press guarantee that knowledge can be disseminated without fear of being stopped uh, by the superstitions or hysterias or whatever uh, of anybody. So uh, that is essential to the accumulation and the dissemination of knowledge, too. So it's by that standard, a common standard, by which we can measure uh, all of the different civilizations and cultures. And on the basis of that, I would say modern Western civilization, uh, more particularly in its Anglo-Saxon variant, is the most advanced civilization and culture in the history of mankind. And then, moreover, it is open to everybody. When I say Western civilization, a Western should be understood as comparable to French in French fried potatoes or New York in New York steak. You don't have to be French to love French fried potatoes. Well, anyone can be a Westerner if his mind has absorbed the essential foundations of Western civilization. And from that perspective, I, I think of myself uh, uh, I, uh, my sympathies lie with Greco-Roman civilization, not with the barbarians who destroyed it. My ancestors, I'm sure, numbered among the barbarians. But I identify with Greco-Roman civilization, not my savage ancestors. And that should be uh, what we would look for in every educated person. And by that perspective, if an American Indian were educated and uh, made Western civilization his own in his mind, because he understood mathematics and science and the laws of logic and uh, all of the other uh, essentials of Western civilization. And when he was asked who discovered America, he would say Columbus, because he would understand that Columbus was the one who brought to the Western Hemisphere his ideas and values, what were now his ideas and values. What the politically correct uh, axis is asking people to do is identify with their savage ancestors on the grounds that they're of the same race. Um, they have no concept that civilization and culture are intellectual matters, and they're racist. Uh, they think that culture is racially determined. So there's Western civilization, they think, is the culture of the white man. Uh, something else is the culture of, uh, of Hispanics or American Indians or Asiatics or whatever. And they don't see that everybody's ancestors, if you go back far enough, were savages, and we should not be identifying with our remote ancestors. We should be identifying with the highest level of civilization that can be found in the world today. And it's open, as I say, to everybody. How can people read this essay? Well, it's available as a Kindle book on Amazon.com. Okay, so it's called Education and the Racist Road to Barbarism. Now, of course, your, yes. your life's work, the, the huge book, Capitalism, that you have, uh, which is just a treasure trove of... Uh, I mean, I remember not too long after I was married, actually, I got that as a Christmas gift from my yeah. wife. And uh -huh. she, when she got it in the mail, she just couldn't believe that I was going to read this thing. She just could <laughs> not get over this. And she remembers what we were expecting our first child, so she would sleep late in the mornings. But she could yeah. hear the sounds of me turning the pages in another room in the morning when she would wake up. She knew I was awake because I was flipping through Reisman's Capitalism. How can people follow you online and get to know more about your writings? Okay, well, Capitalism is also available at Amazon.com. 
both as a Kindle book and as a hardcover book. And also on my website, www.capitalism.net, uh, I have articles that I publish on my blog intermittently. Uh, George Reisman's blog, G-O-R-G-E-R-E-I-S-M-A-N-S, blog, dot blogspot, dot com. George Reisman's blog, dot blogspot, dot com. And I'm also on Twitter at uh, capital G-G-R and lowercase E-I-S-M-A-N. G-G-R, E-I-S-M-A-N. Well, George, I appreciate your time today. We'll have to talk to you more often. There are so many fallacies, and you are a fallacy killer par excellence. Thanks again for your time. Well, thank you, Tom, and you too. You are also. All right, everybody, a bunch of things to tell you about. I'm still working on those Ron Paul homeschool courses, as you know, for the Ron Paul homeschool program. RonPaulHomeschool.com is where to find out about it. And you can get my courses, at least the ones that are completely finished, over at TomWoodsHomeschool.com, and I insist that adults can and do enjoy these courses. You will not be talked down to, and you will be able to learn a lot of stuff you probably wish you knew but figure you don't have time to learn. Well, now you do. So I've got Western Civilization Part 1 up and running, and my government course up and running. Well, if you're at Ron Paul Homeschool, my course in progress right now is Western Civilization Part 2. So last week I covered mercantilism, I talked about Louis XIV, I talked about the War of the Spanish Succession, uh, then, I guess that was two weeks ago, then last week I talked about the Hohenzollerns, the Habsburgs, Peter the Great in Russia, I caught us up on art, so I talked about mannerism and the Baroque, and then this week it's the Scientific Revolution and a little bit of discussion of the Enlightenment, and that will continue next week. So I am really, re really being kept on my toes by this project. So ronpaulhomeschool.com will take you to a page that will make the case for why your student will flourish under this program. And if you want just my courses, the place to go is tomwoodshomeschool.com. Also, remember, I've got some events coming up. Houston, January 24th, then a Looks like probably Florida Atlantic University in late February, but that's not fully cast in stone, so I'll get back to you as soon as I know. In late April, I'm going to be in Montreal on a pleasure trip, but I'd love to do a meet and greet. If any of you live in Montreal, drop me a note via the contact page at TomWoods.com, and you know maybe we can do a little something while I'm there. Then remember, in Dublin, Ireland, on May 22nd, I'm going to do some type of event, and if you live there... Again, drop me a note via TomWoods.com, and I'll put you on my list to make sure you find out about whatever it is I wind up doing. I've got a neat week lined up for you next week. Before I tell you about it, remember, the weekend is here. You have time now to sit and relax and read. What are you going to read? Well, my new book, of course, Real Descent, A Libertarian Sets Fire to the Index Card of Allowable Opinion. Get the details on it at realdescent.com. You can get the audiobook read by me via TomWoodsAudio.com. You can even get it for free if you haven't already gotten an audiobook from that source. So please do check that out. I think you're going to like it. The feedback so far has really been good, I'm happy to say. And, of course, you get the Kindle edition as one of the many perks you will find as a supporting listener of this show. So check out SupportingListeners.com for the entire Tom Woods bag of goodies. Next week, we're going to talk to Winslow Wheeler, who's an expert on military spending, and he's going to tell us all the tricks that they use to snooker us on that. We'll talk to Randy Holcomb, who's got a brand new book, An Advanced Introduction to Austrian Economics, but we're also going to be talking to Judge Andrew Napolitano, who has a brand new book coming out next week. We'll talk to him on the launch date of that book, and I'm telling you, this is the most important work the judge has ever done, and that's saying something. You're not going to want to miss that, so make sure you're a subscriber to the show on iTunes or Stitcher so you don't miss a single episode. You can subscribe easily using the buttons we have over at TomWoodsRadio.com. Thanks so much for listening and for the support, and we'll see you next week. The Tom Woods Show.